I had actually gone back to a novel that I had started decades earlier, it feels like decades. And I was looking for a backstory for this character because in that novel, which I've never written, this character goes to great lengths to solve a mystery. She goes to France, she goes to China, why? And everything that I was coming up with, my editor, or my agent, I was working with him, he's, he was like, no, that's dumb, that's too obvious, you know, dig deep, he would say. So I'm in that frame of mind, I'm looking for a backstory for this character in this other novel. And I actually woke up in the night with the opening sentences of what was to become the Marsh King's daughter fully formed in my head. I wasn't dreaming about the character. The sentences were just there. And the sentences were, if I told you my mother's name, you'd recognize it right away. My mother was famous, though she never wanted to be. Hers wasn't the kind of fame anyone would wish for. J.C. Dugard, Amanda Berry, Elizabeth Smart, that kind of thing, though my mother was none of them. And so I thought, huh, well, this is interesting. So this character is the daughter of a kidnapped girl and the man who took her. So it sounded interesting, intriguing, but I was too sleepy to get up and write the sentences down. So I repeated them over and over in my head so I would be sure to remember them in the morning. In the morning, it still looked like a good idea, surprise. <laughs> so I wrote up a few more paragraphs in the character's voice, basically just her telling me more about who she is and, and how she grew up. And I sent that to my literary agent and I said, will this work as backstory in that other novel for this character? And he wrote back saying, you know, it was cool and it was creepy and it would absolutely work in another book because it was too much backstory to shoehorn into this other story. It, it basically deserved its own book. So in the coming days, she kept talking to me. I kept writing little snippets in her voice. And so I thought, well, I have to find a, a story for this character. Now, I should back up and say, when I was writing those, those paragraphs that first morning, I almost gave the book an urban setting because I was thinking about the young women in Cleveland, how they were hidden away in plain sight for so long, which of course is it's a terrible thing. But for a writer, it's, it's kind of intriguing. and Maybe you'd like to explore that. But I decided that was maybe a little too obvious. So I set the book in a cabin on a ridge surrounded by marsh or swamp in Michigan's uh, Taquaman River Valley. And the reason I set the book there is because, as I mentioned earlier, my husband and I homesteaded in that area, and we know the area very well. I had always wanted to set a book in the Upper Peninsula, and, and this seemed like it could be the one. So I had the character, I had the setting, but I had no story for the character. What was going to happen to her in the book? I had no idea. So at that point, I got my childhood books of fairy tales off the shelf. <laughs> I've got them right here. These books, Hans Christian Andersen and the Brothers Grimm. And I started paging through looking for a fairy tale that I might be able to use to structure the story. The reason I did that is because um, I was familiar with a book by A.O. and Ivy called The Snow Child. It's set in 1920s Alaska, but it parallels the fairy tale, The Snow Child. She and I have the same literary agent. And so that's what gave me the idea. Well, maybe there's a fairy tale that I can use, you know, for my novel to structure it. Well, when I found The Marsh King's Daughter Fairy Tale by Hans Christian Andersen, the fit was so perfect. I, I just knew, I knew at that moment that I had something special. And so for those who aren't familiar with the fairy tale, in the Marsh King's Daughter fairy tale, the Marsh King's daughter is the daughter of a beautiful Egyptian princess and the evil Marsh King who takes her. Well, the character who came to me in the night, she's the daughter of an innocent girl and the bad man who kidnapped her. In the fairy tale, the Marsh King's daughter takes place, it's told from the point of view of a stork, and it takes place in Viking country in the north. I had already set my novel in Michigan's far north, right? And again, in the fairy tale, the Marsh King's daughter, whose name is Helga, by the way, which is why I named my character Helena, Helena Pelletier. <laughs> um, the Marsh King's daughter in the fairy tale by day is beautiful like her mother, but she has her father's wicked wild temper. And then at night that flips and she takes on her mother's gentle nature in the guise of a hideous frog. So the fairy tale is all about the struggle of good and bad within us, you know, what, which is going to come to the fore. And in the case of Helena, she is genetically half her mother, half her father. So what is she going to be? 
So like I say, that's the point when I knew that I had something special. So um, I spent about a year and a half writing the book. My husband and I were doing furniture upholstery at the time. And um, I didn't even help him in the shop because I was, I can't, we, were, we were kind of putting all our eggs in this basket. The character of Helena, she is so fascinating because um, it, briefly, again, for those who haven't read the book, uh, Helena, so for her first 12 years, she grows up with her mother and father in a cabin on a ridge surrounded by swamp, never sees another person, not anybody. Uh, I gave her a stack of National Geographics so that she could learn something of the outside world and learn to read, but she's a little tomboy. She loves hunting and fishing and foraging. She adores, worships her father, doesn't have much use for her mother, but that's because her father showed disdain for her mother as she was growing up. And so as a little toddler and a child, that's what she learned. Mother is nothing, father is everything. And so at the end of the opening uh, introduction to the Marsh King's daughter, Helena, you know, she starts out saying, if I told you my mother's name, blah, blah. And she goes on, I could tell you this and that about her, but I won't because this isn't her story, it's mine. <laughs> so she's got this little selfish streak that she exhibits right from the beginning. So the book is, because it's told from her point of view, both in the present and in the past, it's all about her thoughts and feelings and her relationship with her father. And so the mother definitely gets short shrift. I mean, she's a very tragic figure. She was kidnapped at the age of 14 by this man, you know, um, hidden away. When Helena and her mother leave the marsh, things don't go well. Her, her parents are not very supportive. They expect her to basically step back into life as if nothing had happened. And and I, she dies, I don't specify how, but she dies early on. Again, because as the author, I had to get rid of her because this story is the Marsh King's daughter, right? So how Helena grows up, up to the age of 12, when she finds out the truth about why they're living this way, that's half the book. And then in the present day part of the book, she's a young mother, two little girls. She's still living in the Upper Peninsula but she has reinvented herself because there was a lot of notoriety when she and her mother left the marsh and she just wants to put all that behind her. So her husband does not know her history. And he has been in the maximum security prison in Marquette, Michigan, which is maybe 50 miles from Helena's home. And he escapes during a prison transfer and disappears into a wildlife refuge or so he makes police think, but Helena knows he's coming for her. So the modern day part of the book, she has to use the hunting and tracking skills that he taught her when she was a child to find him before he can find her. So, you know, cat and mouse game in the present interspersed with how she grew up. Um, so writing Jacob, her father, it's actually very easy for me. And, and I think this is probably true of all authors, even though I'm not him. When I'm writing him, I understand him. I know how he's thinking. I know why. I know why he kidnapped, you know, the Helena's mother, and um, I know that he he tried to shape Helena into a little version of himself, not realizing that eventually that you know would turn on him because that's that's how it happens, you know, where the the uh, pupil surpasses the master, right? <laughs> so um, yeah, it's. In my mind, he's actually a sympathetic character, and I know he's a very bad man, but that's just how it is when you're writing the book. You have to understand all your characters in order to be able to portray them accurately. I knew how the story was going to end, you know, from the beginning, but uh, the road there is is always fun. You know, it's it's so fun as a writer. I, I work from a, a very sparse outline because I like to have those moments of discovery where as you're writing, like, for instance, um, there are imaginary characters that appear. Uh, Helena has some imaginary friends that show up about three quarters of the way through the book. And that was not planned. And it's just something that that grew out of the story. So um, I did know how it would end. And um, 
I, I think what happens with that, if you're really inhabiting the character, it's just as exciting. You know, even though we know what's going to happen, you're you're living it through the eyes of the character as you're writing it. And I would say, like, from a craft standpoint, um, one thing I learned from this book, I learned a lot, but one thing was don't hold back on the emotional uh, aspect of what's happening. You might feel like it's a little over the top, you know, with your character, you know, just feeling things so deeply, but if the writer doesn't put it in there, then the reader can't feel it either. So uh, yeah, I, it's a little bit of method acting, I think, when when an author writes. And um, yeah, it, I guess it was exciting because, you know, Helena doesn't, the reader doesn't know what Helena is going to do when she finally catches up with her father. She doesn't know what she's going to do. Her father doesn't know what she's going to do. He knows what he wants. Will he get what he wants? So all those things, yeah, they make it really fun to write that kind of story. So on The Wicked Sister, as I mentioned, um, I took a two book deal with Putnam and, and some of the foreign publishers as well. And um, so my editor laid out four criteria that the second book should share with the Marsh King's daughter. So it would have a, a same or similar setting it would also be psychological or possibly domestic suspense. It would have a fairy tale element and an intricate structure. And I was really happy that he named those last two things because those were some of the things that I was most proud of with The Marsh King's Daughter. So then my challenge became, okay, incorporate those four elements, but don't copy The Marsh King's Daughter. So um, I did look through the books of fairy tales to see if I could do the same thing, um, use one for structure. No single fairy tale spoke to me. So what happens with The Wicked Sister is it, it actually draws elements from fairy tales in general. So um, it's about two sisters that live, and this is the opposite of Helena's situation. Her family is squatting in a remote cabin. Well, the two sisters live with their parents in a gorgeous over-the-top log cabin that's been in the family for generations. Um, fictionalized that the the great grandpa was a lumber baron and he's basically set aside, aside these 4,000 acres for himself so they're untouched. Her parents are wildlife biologists so this is a beautiful place to do research right because it's never been logged and, and any of that and so you know the family grows up there well that's similar to like in a fairy tale the castle in the forest right and then um, there's obviously a rivalry between the two sisters because the book is called The Wicked Sister. And again, that shows up in fairy tales like Cinderella and, and so forth, you know. And then um, the book also employs talking animals. <laughs> and that's a, obviously a real standard part of a fairy tale, too, is you have uh, animals imparting wisdom to you. So uh, I'm real happy with, with how that book turned out.